Today is the fourth Sunday of the Lenten season, and our scripture lesson for today's message comes to us from the Gospel of John, chapter 9, verses 1 through 12. Will you hear the word of the Lord as given to us in, uh, from the Gospel of John? As he walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents, that he was born blind. Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, He spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbors of those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, Then how were your eyes opened? He said, he answered, The man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> when I initially looked at this gospel reading for this fourth Sunday of Lent in this cycle, I said, uh, I really, I would really rather not tangle with this text. A text that is, uh, that is asking about pain and suffering and God's involvement in it. Lord, Why was this man born with no sight? Is his blindness the result of sin, uh, his sin, or his parents? Let me find something else to preach on, I said, something light, something more uplifting. But the text began to taunt me, as if to ask, you only offer your people sermons on biblical text where interpretations and understandings are not so elusive Like, for instance, Nicodemus coming to Jesus at night and the Samaritan woman at the well, Uh, the two stories we talked about the last two Sundays. Uh, Great stories to tell, straightforward, no interpretation necessary. The narratives speak for themselves. So, very reluctantly, I stepped into the ring with this text, and I've been wrestling with it all week. I've cried uncle several times, tried to throw in the towel. But the text taunts me. Don't give up so easily. These are the words of Jesus, and any faithful follower of Christ should give this text serious consideration. Well, I just wish, says I, Jesus hadn't said, the man was born blind so that God's work might be revealed in him. Part of seminary training to prepare for ordained ministry is to serve in a clinical pastoral setting. In other words, a a chaplain, a hospice chaplain, or a chaplain in a hospital. My clinical assignment was at University of Kentucky Medical Center, University of Kentucky Kentucky Medical Center in Lexington, Kentucky, just a few miles north of uh, Wilmore, Kentucky, uh, where uh, Asbury Theological uh, Seminary uh, uh, sits. Uh, UK Med Center was, and I think it still is, the only level one trauma center in central and eastern Kentucky, which means all of the serious cases in that region, which includes central, uh, the central Appalachian coal fields of eastern Kentucky and western uh, West Virginia. Uh, all of the serious cases and serious accidents, accidents were brought there. Uh, when folks from eastern Kentucky and western West Virginia sent, were sent to the hospital, the whole the entire family came and camped out of the hospital until their injured family member or ill family member, were, they were either discharged or they died. 
And often there would be six, six to eight people, family members, in a room, a, a hospital room made for two people, two patients. On one occasion, uh, I was called to offer pastoral care to a family whose, whose 20-something rowdy son had wrecked his truck into a tree after a night of excessive partying. And the young man was not expected to survive his injuries. And I was, as I was trying to offer them comfort and prayer and just the ministry of presence in their hour of grief and despair, the older brother of the injured man, who had somehow survived his own wild streak, said to me, you know what this is, preacher? This is God's two-by-four upside my brother's head. He lives to party, drink, and chase girls. And what this is, is God's wake-up call for my brother. Well, that wasn't the time or place for me to offer corrective theological insight. But the obvious response in a different setting might have been, well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. God didn't hold your brother down and pour beer down his throat. God wasn't behind the wheel of his truck with his foot on the gas when it slammed into the tree. No, this is a result of the reckless actions of your brother. That's the reason he was airlifted to the hospital and is now hooked up to life support. Let's, let's not blame this one on God. Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents? That he was born blind. Now, I don't even understand why they would ask about the man's sin. How could, the, how could he sin before he was born? How could he sin in his mother's womb? Unless they believed in reincarnation uh, and he had sinned in a previous life, but the Jewish faith did not believe nor teach reincarnation. The sins of parents visited, being visited on their children was an Old Testament idea. So I can see why they would ask, is this man's blindness the result of his parents' sinfulness? After the first service a moment ago, uh, someone came out and said, my sister uh, uh, was born with some very serious uh, 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 mental deficiencies. And my mother and father, who went to, were faithful church members, my father went to the pastor and said, why, 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 did, why did this happen? And the pastor said, it must be because sins of the parents are visited on children. And the man never went back to church, and I don't blame him. The God that I know, and this is what he said, the God that I know would not do this to a child, an innocent child, because of the sins of the parents. Is this man's blindness the result of his parents' sinfulness? But Jesus answered both questions. He gave an answer to both questions. Jesus, Jesus answered, no, it wasn't the sin of the man that the man was born blind, nor was it the sin of his parents that he was born without sight. Um, and with that statement, Jesus offers clarity to the questions that we ask. Lord, is, is my pain and suffering because of my sinfulness, past sinfulness, or my lack of faithfulness? Now, like the young man just mentioned from Eastern Kentucky, yes, sometimes our sinful actions do result in pain and suffering. Pain in our lives and pain in others' lives. Raucous and careless lifestyles often do bring pain and suffering. Unhealthy living uh, often does bring sickness and disease. Texting while driving often does cause uh, result in tragic consequences. The result of infidelity in marriage usually results in broken homes and families. But what about the man? What about the man, that man, as an innocent baby who was blind, who was born blind? What about that person strong in his or her faith, walking daily with the Lord in the prime of their life, who becomes ill or involved in an accident? Jesus settles that question for us, excluding sinful actions that directly cause pain and suffering Jesus settles that question for us. There is no causation between past sin and pain and suffering. Jesus answered, neither this man 
nor his parents sin. Now, before we move to the next statement that Jesus makes about pain and suffering and God's involvement in it, um, this gospel reading for this fourth Sunday of, of the Lenten season begins at, first, at verse 1 and goes all the way through to verse 41. Uh, and it tells of an embarrassing display of spiritual blindness among the Pharisees, a blindness caused, caused by their lust for power and control over the people. As it happened, it was on the Sabbath day when Jesus healed this blind man. So in their mind, in the Pharisees' mind, Jesus couldn't in any way be associated with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Instead, they said he has a demon. Jesus has a demon because he did the work of making a little mud pie and giving sight to the man born blind on the Sabbath day. Their rage at Jesus, who was attracting the crowds to him and away from them, wouldn't allow them to see the mighty work performed by the power of God in this man's life. They couldn't accuse Jesus of an outright crime, so they highlighted a process or a technical indiscretion against the silly regulations that they had added to the law of Moses over the centuries. And they did this in order to attack Jesus' character, but also to discount his work. This is astonishing, the man said, the man who was healed, uh, who, who was given sight. This is astonishing. You, he was talking to the Pharisees. You call Jesus a sinner, yet he opened my eyes. God does not work through sinners. Until now, never in the history of the world has a person been born blind, received sight. All I know is I was born without sight, and this man gave it to me, he gave me sight. And he could not have done that if he were not sent from God. The result of that action was that the Pharisees put the man out of the synagogue and out of the community of faith. Well, I encourage you when you get home today or, or later tonight or when you do your, your, your devotions to read uh, John uh, uh, chapter 9, verses 1 through 41. Read the entire story. So Jesus answers, the man's blindness isn't a result of his sin. His blindness isn't a result of his parents' sin. And then Jesus says something that's been a source of misunderstanding. <clears throat> then Jesus says this. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. No wonder, no wonder the brother from eastern, eastern Kentucky can conclude his brother's, his brother's truck crash and broken body is God's two before getting his brother's attention. No wonder we conclude sometimes that God sent this pain to my life so, so I would draw, specifically so I would draw closer to God. Or God removed his, his protective hedge around me and allowed this pain in my life so I would draw closer to him. Or this pain is God's will for my life. I don't understand why God is allowing this to happen to me, but if it's God's will. Well, this can't be what this means. I don't believe Jesus is saying God made this individual, made him blind, so that Jesus could use him as an example and make a display of his healing power. It can't be interpreted this way because of Jesus' words immediately preceding the statement. Uh, in other words, God did not inflict the pain in his life because of his sin or his parents' sin. We can't accept that statement and then say, God sent this pain my way so everyone would see that I've turned away from my sin and towards God. Now, that should happen all of the time. But, well, what's going on here? What's going on here? Well, now you get to wrestle with the text. And why did Jesus spit on the ground, mix up mud with saliva, with the saliva uh, and the dirt, uh, and the dirt, and and spread uh, spread mud on the man's eyes? That just seemed gross. As far as we know, there's no healing quality in saliva and mud. <clears throat> could it be, however? Could it be that just like new birth? Jesus using new birth with Nicodemus and living water with the, with the Samaritan woman at the well. The saliva and mud is pointing us to something else. Before Jesus gives sight to the man, he says, as long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. And we're directed back 
to the prologue or the opening statement of John's gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things came into being through Him. And what has come into being in Him was life, and the life was the light of all people. Could it be that Jesus spitting on the ground, making a little mud, and spreading it on the man's eyes and giving him his sight is a signpost for us that points back to Genesis and the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed the breath of life into his nostrils. On Ash Wednesday, when we put the mark of the cross on your forehead, we say, remember that, remember that you are dust, and to the dust you shall return. The Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground, and the one who brought all things into being became flesh and dwelt among us, died on the cross, defeated death, and through the victory of his resurrection, brings to us and for us a new creation. And yes, all of us will return to dust, uh, to the dust of the ground, but that's not the end of us. Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, so if anyone is in Christ, there is now a new creation. Everything old, everything old has passed away and every, uh, see, everything has become new. All I know is he put mud on my eyes. I washed in the pool of Siloam, and now I see. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. In the Old Testament book of Lamentations, Lamentations 3, uh, uh, 32 and 33, it says, For the Lord will not reject forever. Although he causes grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love, for he does not willingly afflict or grieve his children. And the writer of Hebrews says, And just as it is appointed for mortals to die once, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time in his new creation and save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Yes, there will be pain. Yes, there will be suffering in this fallen and broken world. My father used to say, these things we suffer are not God's will for individual lives, but they are in God's general design to wean us off of our dependence on this world and lead us toward the world to come. This text and all of John's gospel is pointing towards and calling our attention to that world to come, God's new creation, when Christ will return and make all things new. We opened our worship with a call to worship that's taken from, as you recognize, from the 23rd Psalm. I'd like for you to just humor me for a minute and take your bulletin, your worship bulletin, and let's, let's use this to close our worship, just the way we did as our call to worship. Respond where it is bold, please. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Can we say that again all together? Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.